Hey, Psych 213 class, this lecture, lecture nine, we're going to talk about uh, long-term memory. We're going to talk about the organization of long-term memory. But before I do that, in this first part, we're going to talk about the idea or the concept of consolidation. Now, what we're talking about here, uh, if you remember, is we have a mechanism for moving information from our immediate memory, this temporary working memory, into some sort of store for more permanent storage called long-term memory. And so this process of consolidation is an important one where these memories are going from a sort of a temporary form to a more long-term form. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, this concept. Now, uh, consolidation, you wouldn't talk much about this in a typical human memory class. It's very challenging to study. If you think about it, you have to control all of the encoding processes and all of the retrieval processes, and you're basically looking at how memories form and whether or not they change or don't change over time. So this is pretty uh, challenging. You will see this uh, literature has emerged from both animal and patient studies where they're what they're doing is they're looking for biological um, mechanisms that uh, promote or interrupt with storage of more permanent memories. And so the, what they're focused on is finding sort of inter interventions that in effect remove or alter memories that were pre previously consolidated or formed. For example, uh, this drug propanolol will block um, some receptors, they're called adrenergic, adrenergic receptors, there you go, see it, right, uh, which are involved in fear conditioning, right, and it reduces fear potentiated startle in humans. So we learned about fear potentiated startle in our um, applied learning lecture. And here you see it in humans that if you give them this drug, if you, if you set up a condition where they learn fear potentiated startle, but then you give them this drug, uh, you essentially eliminate that. So uh, that's an example of a biological intervention that in this case eliminates consolidated memories. Now another thing that's emerging from the literature is uh, this idea that sleep consolidates memory. So let me tell you about a study. There's plenty of studies that are sort of emerging that, that show this, but I'll show you, I'll explain this first study here as an example. So what they did in this study in the Odette et al. paper is they showed people images like a cat, for example, and they showed people the images of a cat in a particular position on this grid. Now the cat also made this meow sound, right? Just like the bell makes a clang sound, etc. So they had a couple pieces of information. They had the picture of the cat, the sound, and the location. Now at the time of test, so this was the learning phase, at the time of test, they were presented with the cat and they had to drag it to the proper place to show that they learned the location of the cat. So an association between cat or object and location in this example. So that's sort of the learning phase in the retrieval phase. Now what they did, which was pretty clever, is uh, they had a couple different groups here. So where it says experiment, really they're talking about uh, groups here. So uh, they had a group that had this learning phase. They then put the EEG on people. Uh, they gave them sort of a, a testing phase to see how much they remembered of uh, the object and location. Then they were allowed to sleep. As you can see, they had a sort of a nap. Then they had a second test, right? The second group did the same thing, but what they did during the sort of a, a period called the slow wave sleep phase, they played the sounds. So they would like hear the sound of a cat, hear the clang of a bell, for example, uh, and they played them to sort of see would, the, would this uh, presentation of the sounds during memory help people learn. Now they compared that also to a group that didn't have sleep and they had uh, compared it to a group who didn't have sleep but heard the sounds, right? So now the key is, uh, what did they find? So what we're seeing here is we're looking at errors. So that's the first sort of thing, that there are errors here on the bars. Um, and the, the key here is um, to look at the difference between the um, nap with no sound. So that's the average of these two bars. And this graph is a little difficult to read because they had other variables going on. But if you average these two bars here in panel A, this is when they had sort of the nap but no sound. But if you notice here, when they had the nap with sound, errors went down. So accuracy got better, right? So this is some evidence that um, sleeping, in this case a nap, results in 
better consolidation of memory. So those are some, that's a, that's a representative of some research which is happening now where people are looking at how sleep actually helps consolidate memories or make them more durable. I have another example too though, uh, and in this case, uh, this is looking at another approach is to ask people to remember things. So you ask them engage in retrieval, and the idea here in this literature is that if you retrieve an item from memory, it makes it more malleable, at least if it's a more recent memory. Uh, and in this case, if it's more malleable, it could be altered and then restored or what they're saying, reconsolidated into long-term memory. So what that means is that if you retrieve an item from memory, again, if it's a relatively recent kind of memory, it's more malleable and it's subject to distortions. So in this Crows et al. paper, what they did is they um, used ECT, which is electroconvulsive therapy. So these were people who were undergoing treatment for uh, depression, and they were given sort of ECT. Now, you have a couple of groups here. So in Group C, for example, they didn't have any ECT. And what they did is they had uh, two groups here. So they had them remember certain memories. So this is the reactivated group. And if you notice in the control group, they remember more of the reactivated memories. That shouldn't surprise you. So think about like working memory when we talked about uh, memories that were more recently reactivated or easier to access, right? That makes them more accessible. And so they remembered more of the recently reactivated memories. They had plenty of memories that were non-reactivated. Chance level is this dotted line here, right? So you can sort of see that they still had some, still had plenty of memory uh, of things that were not necessarily reactivated right before uh, the testing phase. Now in this other group uh, tested, um, well actually let's talk about the tested the same day later. So the B group here, uh, what they found is that the reactivated and non-reactivated also very similar kinds of performance here and they had ECT on the same day. So there is a little bit of depression in terms of memory compared to the control group for recently reactivated stuff, but there's no difference between reactivated and non-reactivated memories. Now look at the group A who got ECT and they were tested one day later. Now what happens is the reactivated memories are essentially gone. They're down to chance level here and they essentially erased or wiped them out in these uh, patients. But look at the non-reactivated memories. They're fine. And in fact, there's no difference across all these groups in the non-reactivated memories. So the idea here is that this biological intervention of ECT disrupted memories, but only memories that were recently reactivated. Because they were recently reactivated, it made them malleable and subject to distortion so that they wouldn't be reconsolidated again, right? So these are some of the studies that are sort of happening. So the way you can think about this, and this image sort of shows you the way people are thinking about consolidation now. Remember, this is sort of a variation of our uh, information processing model such that you have an event, you're going to encode that event, you're going to consolidate that into some sort of long-term memory, right? So this is essentially the, the same version of what we've been looking at. But if you reactivate a memory, right, it becomes more pliant, more malleable, more labile, they sort of would say. Now, a couple things can happen. One thing could happen is that you update this memory with some novel information, some novel experience, the memory's altered and it's updated, right? We update, conditions change, things change, and you make your memories more updated. So this would result in some form of new consolidation. Later on, when we talk about memory distortions, this is essentially, if you think about this path, a way in which memories could become distorted. Another thing that could happen is you could reactivate the memory, it becomes more pliant, but there's no change. Nothing, there's no new information, nothing changes it just gets put back in the same form that it was initially. So in other words, your memory is consolidated again in the same form, right? So that's not that exciting, but that could happen as well. Now let's look at this last little branch here. This is what we were just sort of talking about. If you reactivate the memories, it becomes more uh, malleable, more labile, and to, distort, to restore the memory requires some sort of protein synthesis. And if you... Uh, either use a drug to inhibit the protein synthesis or in the Crows et al. paper they used ECT to disrupt this process and what happens is you can eliminate or remove or weaken those memories. So the idea here is that there's this mechanism by which we can change and then reconsolidate or restore 
uh, memories. Now, for more on this, I know this is kind of complicated. For more on this, I'm going to put a link in uh, Canvas that will um, take you to a memory hackers video. And this video goes through and shows you sort of the Nader et al. study, gives you nice visual representation, sort of explains these things again. And you'll see um, evidence from uh, using testing human subjects with uh, fear memories as well. So you'll see some of that in that other video. Uh, that's basically all I want to say about consolidation. In this next phase, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the organization. In this next part uh, of Lecture 9, we're going to talk about the organization of long-term memory.